Senator Delfo on debate. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, I really didn't um, intend to speak. And Senator Benmar is our expert on rules. She has commented and will comment again, perhaps tomorrow and Thursday. She will be able to comment on the technical content of the bill, but I cannot remain silent following comments that I've heard today, following an exchange between the Conservative groups who, during the pause, discussed these important uh, issues. And I'd like to thank them for having shared some of it. Now, I'd like to bring in certain nuances, certain distinctions that perhaps we haven't discussed yet. Unsadapted. Hey, is Senator Delphonde asking a question? Or He's on, on debate? debate. Okay. I'm on Sorry. debate. Sorry. Sorry. In French. In channel. So, colleagues, this motion, once adopted, will give all parliamentary groups and parties in the Senate more equitable procedural powers, albeit with some remaining discrepancies, such as ex officio voting rights at committee. As such, this motion is a positive step to allow all groups to participate in the organizations of the Senate proceedings, such as the ability to defer votes and also to have committees' hearings outside of ordinary times without two senators holding a veto. This motion is firmly grounded in the Westminster tradition of recognizing parliamentarians' freedoms to associate in groups and to play their part in the legislative process and hold any government of the day to account. This notion, motions enhance senators' ability to perform our constitutional function without the need to be part of a government caucus or of an opposition caucus. Senator Plett has presented these rule changes, these rule change motion as an unprecedented government motion drafted by the, an outgoing Prime Minister office, trying to ambush an upcoming strong majority of a Conservative Party. For those who see conspiracies all around, at the United Nations, at the World Health Organization, at Davos, and other places, this narrative may be appealing. But the facts, the facts are what we should be looking at. And for those that are interested by facts, they should consider that these proposals, these changes, are along lines of previous discussions over many years since I joined the Senate six years ago, such as at the Modernization Committee and at the Rule Committee. Indeed, these changes will bring our rules in line with the changes to the Parliament of Canada Act that we finally adopted in 2022 after attempts in starting in 2020. It took a long time to get there. It has to be part of a budget as one omnibus bill, which I don't like so much, but that part of that omnibus bill I did like. Furthermore, this motion is not a first in Keynesian history. Allow me to quote two passages from our Senate procedures in practice. First, I'll refer to page triple I on the topic of rules and I quote, several minor modifications were made in subsequent years, but those that occurred in 1991 were the most far-reaching. They were put in place following an unprecedented level of partisan rancor arising from the debate over the introduction of goods and services tax, the GST. Among the changes incorporated into the rules, were time limits for specific proceedings, including senator's statements, routine proceedings, and question period. Time limits were also established for most speeches and for the bells for standing votes. 
an ordinary time of adjournment, midnight most days, and at 4 o'clock on Friday, was also fixed. Oh, wait, wait. In addition, <laughs> priority was given to government business, which will be called in the order determined by the government leader or deputy leader. Provisions were also added to allow the government to impose time allocation for its business. And new procedures for dealing with questions of privilege were established. End of first quote. A second interesting quote is found at page 73 of the same Senate procedures in practice. I quote again. The orders of the day are divided in two main categories, government business and other business. This distinction has been in place since 1991, when changes to the rule of the Senate gave priority to the consideration of items sponsored by the government. 1991? Yes. Ooh. Prior to this change, there was no such division. End of quote. Colleagues, from these passages, I note two important points. First, there was no distinctions between government business and other business prior to 1991. Second, there was no rule, no time allocation rule prior to 1991. In inquiring how these changes came about as a matter of procedure, I found that these major rule changes were part of a massive package of rule changes adopted on June 18, 1991, at the initiative of the Conservative Government of the then Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney. Ooh. They were adopted on a standing vote of 40 to 30. I repeat, a standing vote of 40 to 30. Far from a consensus. Furthermore, <laughs> these changes followed the Prime Minister Mulroney's appointment of an extra eight senators to the Senate in 1990 under a section of the Constitution that has never otherwise been used in Canadian history. So, you know, we're not making big history tonight, but it was made in 1991. We can hardly speak of rule changes based on, cons on consensus. As a matter of fact, Section 36 of the Constitution Act, 1867, requires that the Senate makes decisions by majority. <coughs> the Constitution does not permit us to make rules that will require a, special, a super majority, like in the U.S. Senate, because it will be against the Constitution or by implication, for example, giving a veto to a group of 13 senators. Furthermore, as Senator Sinclair said in 2020, in discussing potential rule changes proposed by him and me, as you may remember, it was a thick package, and I quote, consensus should not be a precondition to doing the right thing, end of quote. I believe in that. In short, Senators, the opposition's case against these motions rests on propositions that are inaccurate and especially more furthermore on the vision of our chamber that no longer exists. The reality is that we have now four groups in the Senate and none having a majority. Hopefully this will last. In doing so, we should not be ashamed of what we're doing. In fact, we are following, simply following, the evolutions of the Westminster model. As you know, for those that don't know, well, you will know, as you know, we, we, are, we were modeled on the House of Lords, the upper chamber of the Westminster Parliament. For many decades now, the House of Lords is made of various groups, the four largest being the Conservative, 277 peers, the Labour peers, 172, the Liberal Democrats peers, 80, and the cross benchers, 181 peers. As you can see, none has a majority of seats, and despite the very unpopular Conservative government, which is running England now, its bills make it through the Lords. 
The rules proposed by the motions before us will ensure that these four groups we have here enjoy equivalent status in many aspects. Ultimately, these new rules will, will reflect the equality between groups that we're trying to achieve, a principle of equality which is important for all of us as individuals and as members of groups. And beyond that, it will guarantee the existence of four groups in this place, which comes with the freedom of each of us to affiliate with one of these groups and to change affiliations as time goes and makes us more independent and not dependent of making a move such as crossing the floor when you disagree with your group. <laughs> Speaking of the Westminster model, I think we should go further than what we're going now. We should follow what they've done already. For example, we could elect our speaker. They took away this from the power of the crown. Now the speaker is elected by secret ballot in the House of Lords. And Madam Speaker, that's no criticism of you. I'm sure you will win the votes. But the issue is that that's the model that the House of Lords is going. This is what the Westminster model is evolving towards. Moreover, the chairs of the committees are selected by the whole House. A committee of chairs chairs all the meetings of the committees. And these are the standing lords that have been selected by the whole chamber, not by two or three members of the committee, to be the chair of that committee. Do you know that? Colleagues, I conclude on a note. Some people are concerned about the fact that I might not, at the end of the day, if these rules are adopted, have unlimited time when I'll do in the next speech. I understand the theory. In practice, I never use unlimited time. I don't even use my 45 minutes today, and I no normally don't use it, because I believe that if your message is clear, it can be put towards your colleagues in 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. But if you need more than that, it's because your message is default, is defective at more and more than one place. Exactly. Thank you very much, colleagues, for your attention. And then Senator Quinn. Senator Quinn. Well, thank you, Senator Delfon, for that enlightenment. Would you accept a question? I feel in full energy, I'm fully energized, and I think I'm ready to ask <laughs> to answer questions. I don't think I'll beat you. I have only 45 minutes. What? Thank you. First of all, let me suggest, Madam Speaker, that the Conservative Party fully supports the Speaker in this chamber, even if the members of the PSG don't. <laughs> Senator Delfond, can you enlighten us as to how the, the, um, the rules were changed in 1991? What process was used uh, in 1991, Senator Delfond? He wasn't there. He doesn't know. I wrote. Senator Balfon? Uh, I think Senator Usakos is right. I wasn't there, neither him, neither Senator Platt. As a matter of fact, uh, Mala was born. <laughs> but no, I wasn't there, Senator Platt. But I can tell you that it was a standing vote. I can tell you that it was a long debate. And I can tell you that it was imposed upon the liberal minority. Senator Platt? Well, the fact of the matter, Senator Delfond, in 1991, the rule changes were made through a report of a committee. So it was done by a committee. After study. After study. This is done by a dictator in the House and a dictator here in the chamber, not by a committee. We have been supportive of Senator D uh, Belmar. So are you suggesting that the committee should be completely uh, Circumvented, uh, the opposition boycotted the Rules Committee. Uh, they asked for a vote, but did not debate the changes. So, then, Senator Delfont, like, you're comparing apples to oranges here, are you not? Like, you're, you're with one breath saying in 1991 this was a wonderful thing. We agree. As it was another year. Bring something to a committee and let the committee bring in rule changes. Would you not agree that that is the process that 1991, that's what happened then? And what's good enough for 1991, as you suggested, is good enough for 2024? Senator Delfon. 
Thank you, Senator Platt, for the question. Uh, could you tell us if the report was unanimous? Yeah, uh, I'm rising on debate. Oh, well, I have uh, senators ask, that want to ask a question. I have Senator Gignac, so I'll okay. put you on the list for debate. Senator Gignac. Est-ce que mon collègue accepte une question? Senator Gignac, would my colleague accept a question? Of course, dear colleague. Well, I think we've gone through the background, and I could listen to you much longer. I admire the way you express yourself so concisely. Now, what I'm thinking about is this. The government representative has limited time, and it is Canadians who elect a government and the opposition is uh, also determined by what goes on in the other house, so the most major group. But the representative of independent, uh, of the most, of the ma uh, major group among the independent senators has the same power, the same privileges as the government because, as Senator Odette said, we are a minority, we have to protect minorities, but what would the consequences, the unexpected consequences be if, in seven, eight, ten years, since Quebec still has 24 senators in this chamber, what if there were a group called the Senators of Quebec and that became the major group? Would you be comfortable with that group having the same power as the official opposition and the government? Hypothetical question, Senator Delfon. Thank you. Um, this is a good question. When a minister puts a question to someone who was a judge, it's sometimes difficult. I think, and I understand, the position that there, that there could be a group, theoretically, like this. But I must say that there is a certain uh, logic in the government proposal. When we brought in amendments in 2022, we began in 2020, and we finished with the amendments in 2022, we felt that whoever sat uh, as the leader would be neither from the, would have the same salary as the leader of the opposition. So it was a kind of bridge, no matter what the biggest group was. So if we were to add uh, speaking time, an equivalent speaking time, and it was something that we supported in 2020, in 2022, there might be another way of looking at that, but this respects the logic that uh, is embedded in the bill. Senator Gignac, now I don't want to go on with this uh, uh, forever, but if that's the real reason, I'm not very impressed, because it was decided two years ago that the major independent group would have more time than others, then they would have supplementary privileges, additional privileges. And I think, dear colleagues, that our group uh, represents diversity. Our colleagues uh, are far more represented with us, our colleagues from the indigenous communities, now, this is a house of sober second thought and also defends and represents the interests of provinces and minorities. I'm new. I don't know the ins and outs of all this, but this is, I feel uncomfortable with this. As I mentioned, if in Quebec there were a referendum in eight or nine years, for whatever reason, 
And if Quebec in democratically decided <clears throat> uh, on independence, and there were a group of independent senators from Quebec, well, <clears throat> but no, just a moment. But before Quebec were to separate, well, you know what the, the implications of this are. But I expected other reasons from you. If you have them, I'd like to hear them. <clears throat> well, things aren't always perfect uh, with respect to our concept of an opposition in the Senate. Now, the Bloc Québécois was the official opposition in the House of Commons. <clears throat> there were no Bloc members. <clears throat> there are no members of the Bloc in the Senate. Well, perhaps theoretically in some period of time that you, you've talked about. Well, one time the Liberals were the third party in the House of Commons, but not in the Senate. There isn't always the perfect balance between the House of Commons and here. If tomorrow there were to be an election, and if we to go by the polls, there could be a change, and I think after a certain time, changes are welcome. Well, there could be a group in the Senate, which could be the government group, which would be conservative, and there might be a minister or two in the group. There might be a new speaker of the Senate, and so forth. And there would be a group that was opposing those senators. No. I mean, what if they were progressive conservatives? There could also be cross-benchers or independent senators who could work according to this dynamics. But I think that there would be a role to be played in the House with respect to debates. And it's something that I thought of during the pandemic. <clears throat> I found that it was a good thing that a group could uh, act as an opposition, because During the pandemic, the opposition did some of the work of an opposition. There was a group that was perhaps not as numerous as that of the independent senators, but they had a research budget that was <clears throat> the same because of the work they were doing. Now. It could be a more constructive opposition, but I think there still is a place in the Senate for a group that opposes on the major general principles of the day and that opposes the government in a constructive way, something you could call something that could be like the coalition between the Liberals and the NDP. And if one day he happens to be sitting on the other side of the House, we may not share ideas, but I will respect his mandate. But I think there is a place here for several groups. Some would feel they were more in the opposition, and some uh, would decide on things on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Senator Saint-Germain, thank you, Madam Speaker, Senator Delfon and colleagues, I thank you for your interventions. My question has to do with what you said about the Parliament of Canada Act. Would you agree with me in saying that the amendments brought to the Parliament of Canada Act were a compromise, knowing that there was already in the Senate three independent groups besides the government and the opposition? and that this compromise recognized the fundamental principle of the majority, at least in the Westminster system and in all democracies. And it is in that context that besides financial issues, the idea of a majority group besides the government and the opposition was something we discussed, and it could be something that is reflected in the rules. Secondly, and I'll put the question right away, can we recognize that all groups here, the opposition, the, the government, and the three other groups, all have a mandate to defend regions, minorities, provinces? 
And would you consider that eventually this country made up of 10 provinces and three territories, do you think that in such a country it might not be wise to have one of these three independent groups as a group that could represent one uh, single province? Would, could they have this privilege? Senator Delfon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, there are three questions. I'll start with the last one. It's uh, a hypothetical question. As they say in court, all the facts are before us. We'll see later. Uh, we'll look at how to answer later. Well, with, the, with respect to the first two questions, a group that represented a plurality, could it act as a majority if there's not a majority in the Senate? Could there be a group that could impose its will on the three other groups by using its power and saying, I have two votes more than you, I'm going to uh, impose closure. Uh, I don't know. But I think that the group that has a plurality, and when we came in with the bill and when we discussed it in 2020 and up until 2022, it was Peter Harder in our group who was the sponsor of the bill, and he discussed it with Senator Platt. And it reflects long discussions among the various groups, during which we recognize the fact that groups such as independent, independent senators, who were 40 at the time, but there was a plurality in any case, which was greater than the other groups, and we recognized that it might imply more work the leadership of those groups and the leadership of others. We realized that there were more members in one group and that, therefore, the position of leader might be more difficult. I don't think I said difficulty, but it would be one of reconciliation and listening to others. And I do recognize that. I lived with that, and that's important for me. That's the compromise we made. Well, is it a good compromise? There might be others. There might be better ones, but I was comfortable with that one. I'm still comfortable to this day. My second, to the second question, I refer to the role of each and every one of us, and I think it is to listen, to represent, and Senator Pay tells this to us very often. Uh, I agree with a lot of her opinions, maybe not the bills, but it is about giving a voice to the voiceless. And when she does it, she does it really well. It is our role because people who are elected, they only want the vote of the majority that will go out and vote. They're not really after the vote of the voiceless. So the less uh, economically fortunate and the, the least educated and others, unfortunately, they have a tendency to vote in um, lower percentages as well. <clears throat> Again, talking about Senator Pate, <clears throat> uh, we visited a prison in Joliet, and there is no... Um, member of parliament uh, from the House of Commons who would go to a prison and who would say, well, we need to improve things. So they, they're not really interested about how things are on the inside because it does not bring them any electoral advantage. But we here have to have to listen to the indigenous communities uh, Michelle comes from a region of Quebec that I did not really know particularly, so I met her, and, and we had the opportunity of visiting. And there are many other colleagues here who informed me on the different realities um, in the Northwest Territories. The situation is quite different. And when they have to call someone here in Ottawa, for instance, they can only have service in English or French, and they cannot get a, get a hold of anyone who speaks Inuktitut. 
So it is up to each and every one of us here to carry the voices of different communities here, and the, the voices of the groups should also be uh, here and strong. And uh, affiliating oneself with the group is not uh, suppressing one's own voice. So we are coming together with colleagues to uh, give uh, all of these groups voices. On debate, Senator O'Coin. Apologies, did you have a question, Senator Sarkos? A question, please. Yes. I think I still have 14 minutes and 30 seconds. Senator Sarkos, you have the floor. Senator Dalfon, in your speech, you uh, compared the Senate to the uh, House of Lords. Uh, but it's not the case uh, that comparison simply doesn't hold. And I would invite all colleagues to look into the Parliament of Canada Act. And it's clear that the House of Commons and the Senate, uh, or rather the House of Commons, uh, parallels uh, the, um, the Westminster system. And in your speech, you've also referred to the fact that procedures and rules have been changed over time, and you are right. We are an independent chamber without privileges, and our capacity of creating our own rules and procedures and changing our rules and procedures in a democratic manner. But there's something that has never happened until now. We've never had a government that used time allocation to try to change the procedures and the rules without sending it to the Rules Committee, without having a pertinent and diligent debate, without consulting the experts and consulting all stakeholders and all parties in, in this chamber. Uh, at the end of such consultations, maybe we wouldn't be in agreement with all of the elements of what's being proposed, but that's the procedure if you want to introduce so, such fundamental changes. My question is as follows. Why does this government, why is the government in such a hurry to not go through all of these uh, steps, to skip through all of these steps to introduce these important uh, changes? What's, what's the hurry, um, and why is this government not respecting the historical uh, precedents that we have in this institution? Senator Darfon. Thank you for the question, Senator Sarkos. I like exchanging with you uh, because you like and know about the Westminster model. Um, and I met uh, the facilitator at the House of uh, Lords, uh, who has a very modest office. So I was talking to uh, English Lords, uh, Labour, Mostly, I was trying to understand their system, because when I studied the question, when I uh, uh, wrote the the ruling of the court in 1992, I think the Court of Appeals. But I uh, I read quite a bit about the Senate, and when it comes to the organization of the House of Commons uh, by population that had been very little debated. Everyone agreed that that was uh, taken care of. But for the Senate side, it took two days and there was no consensus. Uh, but the debate had two options, elected senators or appointed senators. Johnny MacDonald and George Etienne Cartier were against elected senators. People forget this, but I said this in a speech five, six years ago. In 1867, the first senators, uh, in the group of 24, you had 17 or 18 who were coming from the Parliament of Union, 24 members of the, from the Council of Quebec, and 24 from Ontario. But people don't know that. Starting from 1862 onwards, they were elected. Every two years, one-third of the Legislative Council were elected. <coughs> and... Sir MacDonald did not really like that because he was afraid that they will steal the legitimacy of the House of Commons, so he wanted appointed senators. The first senators 
uh, had a majority of elected senators. So let us not forget that. And today we have Senator Tanis. Uh, but at the time, we had a lot of senators who were elected. So the House of Lords model was selected, but we did not have aristocracy. Uh, and there was a threshold of $4,000 uh, of, of, of assets. And the convention, of course, will be to have respect for the elected chamber. We did not want to have competition, but complementarity. So the second question was, should it be sent to the Rules Committee? Well, I think the chair of the committee uh, talked about this and explained all the work that the committee has been doing over the years, all the reports. And Senator Green worked on the reform question. Senator Messicott, Senator... Uh, other senators, I just said uh, Bev, if you use your first name, but all of these people, and then we had Senator Cordy, who sat on the committee. So all of these questions and many others were explored. What I proposed was accepted, and it, it was a step in the right direction. And um, you, need, you always need the first step, otherwise you, you don't get anywhere. So it's not sufficient. I said this to Senator Gold because he explained the first uh, idea to us, and there were also amendments to the to the text. It's not it's not really the first text, and I hope that there will be other amendments in the future. But this, I think, is a good start. And uh, I think we discussed sufficiently about it. We have sufficient number of reports. I think it's time to take action. Thank you. Senator Husakos, a supplementary. If I understood your response well, Senator Dalfon, uh, you are open to having amendments on this motion. Senator Dalfon, I would say that the consensus, or rather the, 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 the principle should guide us, and you accept it to do something that's uh, minimal, and I think that's what's before us today is minimal. Let's go for the minimal, and then we will talk about other changes, but for the time being, let's go for the minimal. want to amend and have sub-amendment and all of that. We know what it leads. So. We have discussed these things in our group. Other groups have done so. We have proposed some amendments. Somewhere, the dinner hour, for example, and some other uh, provisions were amended. I think we are comfortable with what is beyond us. It's not perfections, but let's proceed. 